Our presenter today is Maureen Basco. She is the current president of the uh, Historical Society, and she's lived in Clinton since 2010. Um, Maureen retired uh, as the executive director of the Central New York Psychiatric Center. Uh, if she can handle that job, she can handle the Clinton Historical <laughs> Society. <laughs> <laughs> One of her groupies just did that, so I don't know what that means. Which one? <laughs> I'm not naming names. Um, oh, yes, you. <laughs> uh, a few years ago, she bought a 150-year-old home, and the, she said that that became her retirement project. Um, Maureen also volunteers for the Historical Society in addition to being the president, so she's in here working as well as telling us what to do. Um, when she was asked what she does to care for her house, she quickly laughed and says, I clean, paint, and hire. Um, <laughs> in that order. <laughs> Cleaning, I don't know what that means. Um, Maureen felt that her, old, that her house, the old bones of her house, had untold stories, and so she began to peel away the onion to try to learn those stories. What I heard, however, before I let her have the mic, is that why she really did this is because she wanted to make sure that no one had ever died in that house. Uh -huh. <laughs> we'll be talking about that. <laughs> now, I don't know what she found out, but that's, that was the story. So without any further ado, I introduce to you Maureen Vasco. Thank you folks for coming today, and I welcome you, and I hope you enjoy hearing about me and my house. Um, you're gonna see me do this a few times, because uh, you're blurry this way, <laughs> but the words are not. Okay, all right. So this talk comes with a cautionary tale. And my book. My experience comes with a warning. But you know what? I'm going to read some notes first from Ed Stanley. Ed did a, a talk in 1964 about the homes in Clinton. And by her happenstance, I happen to come across his notes. And I read it, and I started laughing out loud. But if you bear with me, I'll be quick. Just two paragraphs. This is Ed. I've been asked to introduce the subject tonight, but I would caution you not to expect any startling discoveries. <laughs> I may be one of the old residents, but when it comes to old Clinton houses, it's what I have read or been told about them by others. Another word of caution, historical information, written or oral, can be inaccurate, especially regarding dates. So be skeptical, as you will, uh, as you wish, about any so-called facts that may be stated tonight. <laughs> and, and I'm like, wow, Ed, you are right. You are so right. And I have a lot of examples as to why I would even, even say that Ed is right about that. But this job is really about summoning, summoning your inner detective. And I even have a glass for you <laughs> to look at some of the things that we have today. And another caveat is, Looking into the history of your house is a lot like Alice falling down the rabbit hole. Because what happens to you is you're on a line of inquiry and you're going and going and going, and then you're like way afield, way, way afield. And sometimes you might be in the right neighborhood, but you're not. I'll, I'll use an example. There's a family that um, was very prominent in Clinton back in the mid 1890s. Their last name was Wicks. The dad's name was Constant. He was a justice of the peace, and they lived on Water Street. <coughs> Constant Wick's wife's name was Sarah. And I wanted to learn, I had learned some things about Constant. I wanted to learn a little more about Sarah. But the difficulty was, is that Constant's mother, sister, wife, <coughs> and daughter-in-law had the first name of Sarah. So it was kind of on the confusing side. So you kind of had to really be tenacious in making sure you were looking into 
the right person that you're concerned about, you know, what, what their history was, okay? All right, so, the first thing to identify is what is your motive? Some folks want to do the history of their house because they want to have an original, as they could, a replica, if you will, of the front porch. And that is something that people will really study. They want photographs of their home or photographs in the neighborhood, and they want to have something that is characteristic of the time when the house was built. Another motive is personal curiosity, wanting to know what life was like for the folks who lived in your home. And another is, um, what was this family's or this home's connection to the broader community? Now my choice, in case I haven't tipped my hand already, was I was very interested in who the people were that lived in my house. My house is 150 years old, as Rose mentioned. Um, I didn't know a whole lot, I knew a little bit um, through my real estate agent and the seller's real estate agent, but I was kind of on my own and I had a circus sign on the front porch that said 1873. So I'm like, oh, 150 years, oh, that, that's a lot, of, a lot of info. So that's how I started and what ended up was I became more curious about the people, but then because of their lives in Clinton, I felt a greater connection to the community at large. These are the types of research that, that are required to pursue learning about your house. So for example, and I want people to feel comfortable coming up later, um, I have examples of what I used and that might be helpful to you if you have some interest. Also I developed a brochure. I used what Dick Williams had set up years ago, and I updated it with some information, and you're welcome to um, pick up a brochure on your way out, and it offers the tips that we're going to cover tonight, or this afternoon, about researching um, the background in your home. So, one of the things you look at is the land. For example, when you buy your house, you are purchasing an abstract. I bought a few houses in my life, and I never walked away with the abstract, but I paid for it. But what I did was I called my attorney that represented me in the closing, and I was provided an abstract. And I have it with me, and it's about that big. Um, another thing that you'll look for is property transfers, and a lot of that information is in your, in your abstract. But in mine, for example, my house was built in 1873, but my abstract starts at 1896, because there was a fire during that period of time and some of the old records, they went out in smoke. Maps. I have a couple of maps here for folks to take a look at. 1874 and the 1907 Atlas. And my house, the property from my house is on the one and my house is on the other. And I can get into, well, why did that happen? Well, then you get into, well, when did they design the map? How long does it take, you, you know, they, so you get what Ed was saying, not everything is exact. Um, let's see, oh, another thing that you, um, you might wanna be interested in is looking at the census. So on the 1907 map, it lists the family Pulse, P-U-L-S-E. Um, the family, uh, the husband, dad of the family was a German uh, born native and he moved to this uh, country and he had a family here. His name is on the property. Eventually, they dropped the E and his name was what you would probably still say, Poles or Poles. It was P-U-L-S. And here they are in, an, in a late 1890s census with all the kids. And they were the only family that lived on Prospect Street. So on the maps, you're gonna notice at times that there's other buildings that are on like the 1874 map, but they weren't living there yet because they're not in the census, okay? Right. Another item that will give you information is the directory. Now all of the things I'm showing you, I benefited from. And I, all of these items, I learned about them here at the Historical Society. This is a Utica directory, and this is the Clinton section. And what they did back in the day before phones is that they would list people who were residents and then they would list where they lived and where they
they worked. So for example, um, Josiah Lorenzo Cook was the original owner of the property that I currently own. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about Josiah in a few minutes, but he's listed here. He never lived in the Prospect Street property. He lived in several homes. Um, he lived for quite a while in what is now called the Heinz Funeral Home. And while, that was, uh, while he was living there with his family, he built the house that's on the corner of Marvin and Chestnut. And Mr. Gridley talked about that in his book. Josiah built it out of brick. And if you look at the house, it still exists and it's made of brick. And the brick was manufactured here in Clinton. It's kind of cool. I have another picture which I benefited from, from a talk that Dick did. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble with the technology people. Um, Josiah had this house built, but it wasn't a house. It was a warehouse for his business. When he and Theodore Thompson first went into business, they had a coal business, and this was their warehouse. And I know you talk about it too, Wade, when we bring the kids out for history. It's right on the canal. Right on the canal. Yeah. Eventually, Josiah's business morphed into being a provider of produce and feed and clothing. And he did a huge business all over the area and in New York State because he benefited from the use of the canal on the side of his uh, warehouse. Does that still exist today? This building, yes. It's 43 College Street. 43. I did visit the Oneida County's clerk office, which is part of, um, it's recommended for next steps when you're pursuing the history of your own house. And what you do is, um, they have wonderful people that work there and they're very helpful. But now um, when you enter the building, there are guards there and you have to you know, like state your purpose and they tell you where to go. And then you go upstairs, you identify yourself, and they now assign people to help you. With older homes, you uh, usually have to go to the basement to look at um, deeds and transfers of property and a staff person will accompany you. So it looks um, or sounds a little daunting, but actually there's a lot of great staff there that are willing to help you out. Okay, now, I am going to talk a little more about Josiah, and there's a Clinton map, one I used, and this, to give you a, a real close picture of what the map looks like, my house is the one that's identified as Josiah with no house attached to it. Yeah, there, that's me. But this is where Josiah lived with his family after he built the house of bricks. So he had all that property. Okay. <laughs> Josiah, for those of you, to me he's important because he was the, more, the original owner of the property. Um, he, he, had, uh, he had a really uh, successful business in New York State until, until he did. And this is the part that um, I'm very sensitive to is that these folks had very challenging lives and yet they they worked hard they were very community oriented they had families in jo josiah's example he was married to constant wick's <laughs> eldest daughter jane and they had three children and all three of those children died before they reached the age of four and mary or sorry jane she also passed away and she was only in her 20s i don't know what the cause of death was, I haven't been able to uh, identify that, but I was just touched by how sad that is. Um, and they are all buried over at the old burying ground. Josiah went on to um, marry his partner's sister. So Theodore's sister, Abby Patience, they got married and they had four children. Josiah was identified as one of the um, most successful shippers in uh, produce uh, merchants in the state and yet he also had a reputation of not being overbearing about people having 
food on credit and then paying for it. And I bring that up, it's in his obituary, which was published in the Clinton Courier, but he was the kind of guy that if you were in need, he was going to cut you some slack, if you will, and he didn't pressure people to pay their bills. So on the one hand, in one census, he had um, real estate uh, benefits to, to, in his name of, of about $12,000, but then in um, 1873, he had, a, he had to claim bankruptcy because he had debts that he couldn't meet in, at the tune of $45,000. So this was someone who um, worked hard, was a beloved um, community member. He was a vestryman with um, St. Stone Presbyterian Church. His brother James has a stained glass window in his name, because James was very much involved with the Stone Presbyterian Church as well. He, um, he also was the first president of the village of Clinton, and that was in 1862. Um, so I thought he was a very important person to know about. Now, Josiah's not on my abstract, because I have an opening, but the first person that is in my abstract, his name is Fred E. Payne. I'm gonna show you a picture of Fred. Fred is <laughs> a character. This, Fred is right here. There he is. He was the postman for almost 17 years. He also was the president of the Swan and um, the Humane Society, I'm, I know I'm missing the name, right? Yeah, Stevens and Swan Humane Society. He was the first principal of the high school. He went to Hamilton College, he was trained as a lawyer, but he never practiced. And I also found in the Clinton Courier a profile about him. And the way the profile was written, I, I, I'm not even exaggerating a little bit. The reporter said, if you haven't met Freddie Payne, you gotta wait a minute, because he'll find you. <laughs> he was gregarious. The way he's described, he sounded like he would be a patron at the Cheers bar on TV, where everybody would know your name. But this is Fred, and this is 1913, and he is a mailman at Christmas time. At the very bottom of this photo, it says Christmas 1913, and his daughter is right here. That's all about. Now, Fred owned the property. But he never lived there. So I'm like, how'd that happen? I mean, like, he, he never lived there. So the effort became, how do, I, how do I do this? How do I bridge this space to that space? And so what I decided to do was spend a whole lot of time on Ancestry.com and on FultonHistory.com. And I have, I, who knows where I put it, I have a flyer from the library, for those of you who don't know, they gave it to me, but you can get it as well. They're providing Ancestry.com for free at the Kirk Kirkland Library. So if you're interested, that's a place where you can get some help and you won't have to pay the fee for having it on your home computer. So this, this took some effort to try to find out how Fred hooked up with the prospect property. Because I was finding information about where he did live, and he lived in a variety of places. At the time of his death, he lived at 40 William Street, but he never lived at Prospect. So I'm like, how did you know? So I'm going through the Clinton Courier, and I'm going um, through the Courier by way of the FultonHistory.com website. And one day, I like felt like I struck gold <coughs> because I found an article. Because a lot of things were written in the newspaper in those days, as compared to what we're experiencing today, and I hit it. Fred Payne bought Prospect Street, and it was called the Bangs Place, via George King, who was a lawyer in town, for Sarah Banks, who was currently living in California. So I'm walking away thinking, who are these people? I, you know, right now I'm like friends with Fred. I know his daughters, I know his wife. I mean, really, and I think he's, he's quite the character. And I'm like, wow. So I gotta find out about the Banks. So Sarah, I have a first name, well, what's her husband's name? And again, we're talking about doing research the old-fashioned hard way. You have to be tenacious. Um, her husband was Charles Carroll 
Banks. So, and he went by C.C. Banks. So, okay, I got a name. This is fabulous. I got a name, and I also got a sketch. This is C.C. Banks. Now, C.C. Banks bought the house in 1882. And, I'm, and it was in the paper. I don't even know who he bought it from, but it was in the paper. And I'm like, yes, this is great. I got a beginning. So then I'm working at, did he and Sarah ever live there? No. They lived on Utica Street because <laughs> Cece's father, Dwight, was a long-standing resident of Clinton, and he lived on Utica Street. So they had a homestead on Utica Street, and that's where they lived together. Charles was Dwight's uh, youngest son. Dwight, Dwight, by the way, was a farmer and a courier, and that's what he did, but he lived here for over 30 years. So Cece, you know, he kind of looks like a studious man in this sketch, but he sounds like he was very different than that to me. The way he made money was he was a traveling salesman. And I'm like, okay. But he was a very successful traveling salesman. He represented a number of companies, but the one that he seems to have been with the longest was Taylor Baking Soda, which is a harbinger for gold medal flour. That's kind of where that's going. CC traveled all over the eastern seaboard, as far west as Chicago, as far south as you know Georgia and Florida. The headquarters were in Philadelphia and in Baltimore. So this guy, he's traveling a lot. Sarah, who wasn't from this area, she came here after she married Cece. She was from Detroit. <coughs> so they're here and they have two sons. Oh, of note is Sarah, her father sounds like a real character in that on the census he identified himself as a capitalist and when he passed away, <laughs> I'm like, I, I've seen a lot of things, but a capitalist. When he passed away, his, um, he was worth in excess of $100,000. So when I see, I'm like, that's got to be a gazillion dollars today. I mean, when you think about it. But he was one of the first characters in Detroit that got involved in the automotive industry. So he was, he was also a very su successful man. So Sarah's here, they have two boys, um, Leroy and Egbert, and she is here supported by the extended family, and Cece's traveling all over the countryside selling baking products, okay? He starts buying houses in Clinton and in Rome and other outlying areas, and he's doing pretty well. There were periods of time where he didn't work, because at one census I read about this family, like 10 months he wasn't working. He was kind of hanging out at home with the kids, which is kind of interesting because this is still like 1860. So Cece buys uh, the Prospect Street home and he, he puts it up for sale in the Clinton Courier. He made a deal with the village. So he, he lived in town on and off, but his family was here, but he made an arrangement with the Clinton village to rent it out to someone who might need it. So there were times when it was for lease, but here's an ad, which I, got, I love because the house is kind of different than this. This is somewhere around, it was close to when he bought it, so it's like 1863. It says, the house on Prospect Street, Clinton, New York, now occupied by H. H. Wood Esquire. Good barn and carriage house, hen yard, garden spot, and fine grove of trees. Long time given, address for terms and C.C. had his address as Carlisle, <coughs> Pennsylvania at the time. It was his business address because of his excessive travels. Um, I'm aware of three different people who rented it for any length of time. H.H. Wood, uh, he was originally from Richfield Springs. He had two daughters who went to school at Houghton Seminary. So he wanted to be close by for the girls. Um, Ed Garman and William Brockway lived in the house. And Eventually, um, after they were in Prospect, they actually purchased homes, but they, they did lease the house for a period of time. Okay. Now, CC, although he never lived in the house, to me, um, he's an important character because of what happens in his life. He, um, 
He was involved in the Spanish-American War. Now, this is kind of a tricky ride that we learn about how did this happen? Well, Cece's here and he heard about what was going on in Cuba. People were starving. Um, our military were, um, they're injured, they're hungry, they're thirsty, and there's no real care happening. He is one of five people who um, were accepted as volunteers to go down with Clara Barton to bring provisions to folks in Cuba. So he volunteered to do this for three months without pay. Some, at that time, volunteers were getting some monies. He went with Clara Barton and the other four uh, individuals and they were on the state of Texas, which disembarked from New York City and they went down to Cuba. They had to stay on the ship until uh, Santiago was overtaken because the war was going on and he writes, CC writes to people during Clinton as well as in Albany about what he's experiencing. And he went as a nurse. So he went, he had gotten training. He had done some training <coughs> during the Civil War. Uh, he was somebody who was very supportive of the military, but he couldn't be active with the military because he had uh, an accident with a gun when he was a kid and he had lost an eye. So this was someone who was very dedicated uh, to his community and he volunteered to do this. He went down there and when they were allowed to um, be on the land, they were taking care of people like 24 <coughs> seven. People were starving, they were injured and uh, it was dire straits. And he wrote back to people here in Clinton as well as to people in Albany and New York City about what he was seeing. Unfortunately, CC became sick as a lot of people in Cuba did during the Spanish-American War. He contracted yellow fever and he died and um, he was buried immediately in Santiago. People in Clinton and in New York State, friends, politicians, family members advocated for his body to be disinterred and brought stateside and that happened a year later. So that brings CC, his remains were brought to the Arlington Cemetery is where he's buried. He was buried in 1899. Now, I was telling John and Cindy earlier, because we were talking about well, how many people owned my house, and um, I'm the 15th party to own my house. So I'm not gonna talk about all 15, because you guys wouldn't be able to watch the Super Bowl tonight. <laughs> I mean, we'd be here a so um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about three more families, and then I'm going to talk about my neighbors and, and what they had to say. <laughs> so I mentioned the Poles family, and I'm going to mention them briefly, but Henry and Anna bought the house, and um, they lived there with their five children. And one of their, um, they have four boys and one girl, and um, they were very active in, in the community, as one would be with five children. But Henry was a carpenter, but his greater claim to fame was he was an inventor of the first acoustic telephone, which he sold all over the community until he was surpassed by Ma Bell. When a superior product come out, he, it's like, you know what, I'm an inventor, but an obsolete item. So that kind of was his claim to fame. Uh, his son, well, all three, the three oldest boys, they all were in the military, but Lewis uh, had a distinguished career. He went to Hamilton and then transferred to Stanford, became a civil engineer, and he was lauded by the United States government. He was um, an officer of the U.S. Navy. He also was lauded by the Russian government for contributions he made during the war, and he's listed in Fuso in Engineering. So he was a very accomplished young man. Beulah, I'm gonna mention Beulah um, because it's, I, it's interesting to me what I'm about to share with you. Beulah uh, shows up in a 1930 census and she's listed as are all the other individuals on this page as an inmate. And I'm like, what? You know, and then, you know, with a little digging, because a lot of times when you look at the census, it doesn't identify an address or it'll say the town or the village. Um, but she was an inmate at the Utica State Hospital for the insane. And she died in 1935 in Marcy. 
Um, so she's only, she's a young woman, she's in her 30s. She died where I ended up being the executive director. Mm -hmm. So I, you get that. It's like, wow, this is, it kind of gives me, you know, makes the hair on my arm raise up. But it's like, yeah, I think about Beulah, like, you know, how did she die? Did she commit suicide? You know, was she, was she physically ill as well as mentally ill? I mean, I don't know those answers because I guess I'm gonna need to continue my work of trying to find out more about, about Beulah. The next, family I'm going to mention are the Owens. Emrys and Emma Owens bought my house in 1929. Now, if that name sounds familiar, it's because it is. <laughs> um, Emrys attended Cornell, and after which, when he gets out of school, he's a milk tester for New York State. He moved to Clinton in 1922, and he was employed at Delahunt's Pharmacy. He married Emma Hazelton in 1925. In 32, Emrys graduated from the Simon School of Embalming in Syracuse. He had been associated with the Turnock Funeral Home in Clinton. And then when Mr. Turnock passed away in 1942, Emrys went on to own and operate the Owens Funeral Home, where it is located today. Um, I'm gonna throw Dawn under the bus because you know, Remember what Rose is saying, Maureen was worried somebody died in her house. This one's saying, you know, they did funerals at your house. <laughs> and, you know, I'm like, yeah, all right. <laughs> but it, you know, it makes it that much more real because I can see that happen. There's one entrance, you could come in this way, do what you gotta do, and walk out that way. <laughs> uh, like we would right now today. Um, Emerus was a vestryman for St. James. He was active in numerous community organizations, including the Clinton Chamber of Commerce, the Clinton Fire Department, the Kiwanis Club, and the Skenandoah Club. Emma taught school at Franklin Springs and Clinton. She was a matron for the Grace Chapter of the Order of the Eastern Star. She was a member of the Clinton Historical Society, and of course, St. James Episcopal Church. Emerson, Emma, they had one son, and his name uh, was Richard. Now, the Owens sold the house, and it's an interesting dynamic, but they were very close to Dr. Dudley and his family, Emrys and Emma and all. They were very close. Dr. Dudley passed away, and Jesse, his widow, and their daughters, they moved into my house. So that brings us to 1934, when um, the Owens sold it to Mrs. Dudley. And Mary, one of the daughters, the other daughter's name was Josephine, she lived there until she sold the property in 1977 to the Sears family. Dr. Dudley, he sounds like he was a saint. He did home visits, <laughs> like good old days. But he was a physician and a surgeon. His first office was on Three Water Street, and uh, he, it was over the Clinton Career Office. He had graduated from Hamilton College, and um, Jesse had graduated from the Cottage Seminary and the Wesleyan College. They married in 1900, and as I mentioned, they had two daughters. And at first, they lived at 25 College Street. Jesse, uh, some people know Mrs. Dudley. Um, I was talking with John and Cindy at the beginning of today's uh, meeting, and John knew Mrs. Dudley, but she, she lived in the house until she passed, and Mrs. Dudley, did pass away in my house. Um, she died at age 85, and um, it's okay, it's all right, I'm not upset. <laughs> but she did pass away in my house. She was a librarian at Hamilton College and Utica College. She was elected to the Clinton School Board. She was one of two women in that year to be elected to the school board. Before that, it was all men were only on the school board. And she was elected to a three-year term. She um, was the treasurer and the president of the Kirkland Town Library. She was active in the movement to urge women to vote, and she was a very active member with the Clinton Historical Society. Now this is the part I want you to pay attention to. She was a member of the Christian Women's Temperance Group. They held meetings in my house. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, when I, when I found that out, I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> There's, yeah, I probably do have ghosts. <laughs> um, but yeah, Jesse had meetings at the house, and I can prove it, it was in the paper. <laughs> um, Mary, she, like, as I mentioned, she, li she lived in the house until 1977 when she sold it. She was a librarian at Utica College, and she had been very active with the American Red Cross. She was um, trained as one would be trained today in disaster management. So something hit. Mary would be the kind of person that would go out and help people during crisis. Um, she was very active in Campfire Girls, and she was a secretary at one time for Zonta. Now, Mary wrote a letter <laughs> to Phil Munson about a newsletter. Now, to me, that I found it, I think is pretty funny. Now, those of you who didn't know, Phil Munson wrote like newsletters for the Historical Society every month for how many years? Years. years how many years? 30 years. <laughs> so Mary writes to him saying, oh, I really enjoyed your newsletter, but you made two mistakes. <laughs> and then she tells him how to correct it. She said, apparently Phil had written, you know, Mrs. Sally Smith is the first woman who was on the school board. So she said, uh, 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 my mother was, and you know how I know? I was at school and I got pulled out of class because they were having an emergency meeting and my mom needed me to go home and <laughs> she's going on, this is all in here. And then apparently Phil had talked about um, the school um, had stopped offering Greek and Latin. And Mary called Phil out, uh-uh-uh, no, I took Greek at the high school, so you, all you have to do is, this is the information you need, Phil. And otherwise, it was a great letter. <laughs> but I, I think it, I got a kick out of that, that I found that. Where did you find it? What I, I'm working on a project of organizing files, and so um, I'm finding things where they don't, yeah, here, I'm sorry, here. Yeah, this is the only place that don't volunteer. <laughs> um, I was going, and then I found, I found first Ed's notes, and I'm like, that's how I feel. You can't believe anything, you know? Like, and you've got to find it th in three places, and it has to match for you to like really believe that's what happened. And then I'm going through it, and I found this letter from Mary. And it didn't make any sense. I think I was going through, we have files on houses, and we have it divided up by streets. And so I'm going through and I'm like, what the heck is this? And it's a letter to Phil. But it touched my heart because it was Mary Dudley. And yeah, I'll probably have to do a, some kind of blessing in the house about the temperance union meeting then, but that's my worry. <laughs> now I wanted to mention, because in my, um, I wanted to go back to these pro, my list of things to do. All right. I mentioned people, like going to city directories, newspapers, and oral histories. Now that's like talk to your neighbors, talk to your mailman, if he's been around, or mailwoman, if he's been around. So I, I talk to my neighbors. Now on one side, I have um, a pastor and his wife, and they've lived in that house. They're still there, they haven't moved out because I'm there. They've been at, in that house since the late 90s, and then on the other side is a former mayor and his wife, and they've been at in the neighborhood around the same time. And then in front of me, I have the O'Brien's granddaughter and her family. So I'm surrounded by people who know a lot about the history of Clinton. So I bring it up. So what can you tell me about my house? So the pastor is telling me, well, it used to be, it used to be a frat house for the Hamilton College lacrosse team. And I'm like, oh. It's all making sense. <laughs> I go, really? He goes, yeah, Marie. Parties would start sometime around Thursday afternoon and wouldn't end until Monday morning. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> and then he, his name's Rob. What he, says, he said to me was, you know, I don't think Hamilton will allow fraternity houses in the village anymore. <laughs> After what was going on, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. All we get. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, but... The, oh, but I found it funny that we were talking about that, and um, and then the mayor said, "No, Rob's wrong. It wasn't. It wasn't Hamilton. It was the baseball team, and they were here for spring training." And I'm like, "You got to be kidding! I had the cross guys and baseball guys here. No wonder it's it has that feeling of yeah, nobody's been taking care of this place. <laughs> Not lately. <laughs> Needed cleaning." 
Um, so in summary, I guess my observations are these. It, this is a great, great hobby, but it'll, it will eat you up because there's so much to learn and so much to know about the people and what they did in the community. What I also learned was that the folks that lived in my house, they, they were wonderful people. They had challenging lives. Lives were hard. Um, you think about something as simple as transportation where I can just walk out or I, I hop in my car and go wherever. They didn't have that. And then they had such difficulties. They had children who died. They had illnesses. Um, they had, they had um, fam extended family who were ill. Sometimes they had to live together to care for one another. Yet you know what they, every one of them, I think I mentioned for each of the folks I highlighted, is that they were committed to the community. They were involved in their church, and it didn't matter if, which denomination. They were committed to their church, they were committed to their neighbor, and they were committed to their community. They, they got involved. If somebody needed help, they dropped everything and they were there. And I'm like, wow, you know, it's like I kind of miss that because, you know, we, we don't see that as often as we did maybe, like, I'm a little older, but at, when I was a child, I saw it more often than, than I do today. But they took time to celebrate things. Like my buddy Fred, he was involved in getting the trolley hooked up, you know, for the village. And he, would, he was a rabble rouser and he got it done and people were involved and we had a trolley. Um, C.C. Banks, he cleared out uh, his property for the centennial. He put a huge ad in the paper and he told people if they were coming into town for the festivities, they could bring their horses to his land because he had a creek right in the back of his land and they could water the horse, let the horse rest, and then have some fun with the festivals. Um, these guys were really, and the women, really committed to what was going on in the village. And I, I admire that. They um, celebrated little moments and big moments, as I mentioned, the centennial. Like little moments, okay? I mean, this is me um, teasing Chris Ballone. Chris isn't here today, but Chris recently had stopped in and we were talking, she was talking about the Monday Club. And um, she was, you know, we were talking about how everything would be in the paper, like, you know, like I'll, I'll use it. Mrs. Bosco had a tea, and Sally was there, and we we had finger sandwiches, and we had fruit, and a good time was had by all. <laughs> well, I'm hoping everybody had a good time today with me, and I'm so appreciative that you all came to see my talk and hear my talk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, there is. <laughs> I didn't. Oh, this is, there, and, and if everybody's welcome to a brochure, okay. but this is my house, okay. and you're you're welcome to that. Um, there's a better picture on Facebook that Dawn put on. <laughs> but does anyone have any questions about uh, how to research your home and what to look for and that sort of thing? Yes, Dan. you can't do Some of the details are at the United County Clerk's Office. Other than that, I've been pretty fortunate. I got a lot of information from here. I mean, these exhibits I have, some of the books are mine or the libraries. I borrowed, I didn't touch on architecture because like Dick um, has done complete talks on architecture, but I did bring a few books that he had recommended in the event that you're interested in that, and they came from the Kirkland Library. But I, I got a lot of help here. And I did a lot at home, but I did it on my computer. Yes? Um, you said the abstract was the first one listed on your abstract, but Josiah was the first owner. How did you, because how did you know he was if it wasn't, he wasn't listed because on Because his abstract. name is on the map. Oh, okay. He owned the property, but uh, he wasn't on my abstract. Okay. Just going back. Right, okay. so that, if, so if you, I know that I throw out a lot of numbers, but just so you know, I don't know, I, I'm still missing 10 years between 1873 and 1893. But I also am well aware that um, the house was built, but Josiah, is, 73 was the year he went bankrupt. So I think he probably had to do what we would call a short sale because he was in trouble financially. So those are things I still am interested in. Um, when I, I've been working on this, I'm just 
not as a full-time job, but as a hobby for a year. Um, and I say that because uh, some days it did nothing, some days I'm like working like I'm getting paid for it. <laughs> um, and I mention that because it, it, you're, then there's times when your eyes are starting to go rooty kazooty and you gotta walk away because you're making mistakes with too many Sarahs or too many Harriets. Um, but yes, I, I'm still missing 10 years of who owned the house. Yes. Chris, what have you done with this information? Like, you have a list of some sort so that you know you can track it, like a like a family tree, or how do you organize uh, well, it? Oh, it's funny, Patty. Patty is like uh, she's almost like a ringer. <laughs> what I do have. <laughs> This is my timeline, I, I didn't blow it up, but this is everybody who owned the house. And I have genograms on everybody who lived in the house. And I, I mean, yeah, I, oh, sorry, family trees. I wrote, I did, I'm a social worker by background. I know, you can't kick it out of me. Um, but, I'll just, okay, so, oh, this is Fred. This is, this is a family tree, and I got information on you know, how many children, who were their in, uh, ancestors, and um, that sort of thing. But I did, Patty, I did do genograms, and um, I have the obituaries, I think, on everybody. Because in the obituaries, there's data that I couldn't even find. It's like, Ancestry.com is wonderful, but it isn't 100% accurate. I can give you examples from my own family. Yes, Rose? Are you going to donate copies of this to the historical society? Yeah, I'm going to laminate it, too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a treasure trove. Yes, this is. Not only about your house, obviously, but, but genealogy. People could, would, could yes. come in and say, do you right. have genealogical information? Yeah. About, about this family. family. Yeah. You know, you, you've done and the work. Most of these families, we don't, I'm just saying, we don't have genealogical information about them. Like, for example, we have a file on Cook. But it wasn't Josiah and his family. It was um, a gentleman called Lemuel, who was an, um, an ancestor to um, Josiah. There's oh, there's a couple other tidbits. So C. C. Bangs, his grandfather was in law practice with uh, Grover Cleveland. When Grover was a private citizen, he went to New York City and he joined a practice. And it was like Bangs, Leroy, and Sammy Smith. I have the name. But name. So I thought that was cool too that he, a relative of CC's, was in practice with Grover Cleveland. So I, did I answer your question, Patty? Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the things I did do, um, and I, I'm hopeful I'm really clear about it with, with someone who wants to go behind me and, and do their own exploration, is that at first I was like, Fishing, like really, it was like, okay, like, you know, I was like all over the place. And then I'm like, whoa. So what I did was basically take the tips I've written out here in the brochure, and then like, for example, I didn't know who CC Banks was, so I went back to the videotape. I went and started going like, is his name on a map? Is it, his, you know, anywhere near the, in the village of Clinton? So I went back to square one with every new person that I learned about. So that way I knew I wasn't missing them. Or at least I didn't, wasn't aware of this anything. Yes? Do you have to make an appointment with the historical society to sort of come in and no. around? No, we're, we're open to the public on Wednesday and Saturday afternoons from 1 to 4. Um, but if, I mean, you can come in then and you can always say, gee, that doesn't work for me. Can we work something out? And one of us would meet you. I'm confident of that. I will do it, Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> you too. <laughs> She's probably over there. What? <laughs> yes. So we have a stained glass window in the Stone Presbyterian Church. Was that for him? It's in it memory. It was not of for Josiah. It was for her, his brother James. Oh. Okay. Yes, because you know how I know that. I read Midge's book. <laughs> <laughs> I read Dick's book. I've read Midge's book. I've read Stanley's book. I mean, it's a wealth of information that we have available to us. Thank you, everybody, and feel free to